Okay, so quantum computing, I, I guess it's no secret there are various and some of them quite significant challenges to get where we we need to be. And maybe one of the largest, if not the one, is performance versus scale. Can you just sort of explain, I guess, why why that is such a challenge? Yeah, so the most important thing about all of this is why do it in the first place? You know, building any new technology is hard and it's expensive and it takes blood, sweat, tears and capital. But the reason we're so excited about quantum computing is because it allows us to solve problems that aren't just tough to solve on standard computers, they're completely impossible. So a small quantum computer containing maybe 100 qubits, so this is the kind of thing that fits into a, you know, a standard server rack. If you try and compare the raw horsepower of that with a classical computer, you need to build a classical computer that contains something like 10 to the power 20 of NVIDIA's top line GPUs. And then you'd also need to use about a billion terawatts of power. And that's that's a pretty large amount of power. That's that's the ridiculous thing. That's what makes it impossible. The total power generation capacity of planet Earth right now is about one terawatt. So you need about a billion planet Earths to power that thing. So that kind of classical computer is completely impossible. We can't even dream about it. And these kind of quantum computers we're building over the next 18 months. So quantum computers allow us to solve problems that we just can't solve any other way. And the question is, you know, what's it going to take to get us there? And you mentioned this challenge of scale and performance. And that's exactly right. If we can make a few hundred qubits, perfect qubits, we can solve problems that, you know, completely change how humanity runs. You know, the bottleneck of classical computing really limits so many problems we can solve. And the challenge then is how we go about building these things, because qubits naturally aren't perfect. Um, our approach at Oxford Ionics is finding ways to engineer these systems and really find pragmatic approaches that allow us to use standard engineering tools to build these things, rather than going down the rabbit hole of trying to find ever new and ever more complicated physics. Okay, and in terms of what you've uh, alighted on, or at least what one of the most promising ways of doing this is, I think it's trapped ions technology. Um, that seems to be one the most promising approach, but there is difficulty there with scaling. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm no expert, but I think it's something to do with the fact that the the the, uh, the trapped ions have to be controlled by by lasers. So again, perhaps you can explain why that's such a problem when it comes to the scaling part of it. Yeah, that's right. So to build any sort of quantum computer, you need a quantum bit, a qubit, which is the elements that can be in quantum states that allow you to do this this form of computing. And the challenge is always how you build those things. You can build them in a few different ways. You can take an individual atom and then use that atom as the quantum bit. You can build something out of many atoms together and build, say, a resonator that perhaps you cool down to very low temperatures and use this to encode information. And the challenge is always how you go from the physics, and all of these things have beautiful physics and work, to the engineering. And the challenge with almost all of these systems is that building systems that are perfect down to the quantum level is really challenging. There's basically only one system in the world that we can, you know, manipulate and control at a perfect quantum level, and that's individual atoms. Because atoms are guaranteed identical the universe over. You know, the laws of physics give us very few guarantees, but one of them is that an atom here and an atom, you know, four light years away in Alpha Centauri, those atoms are going to behave completely identically to this wonderful engineering resource. So what we do in our processes is we take those atoms and then we strip an electron off to make an ion. So then we have an atom, but it's also a charged particle. So this now means with a chip, and we use standard silicon chips that we manufacture, by applying some very small voltages to the surface of the chip, you can confine and move around these ions above the surface of the chip. So you then have this wonderful hybrid system of these individual atoms, charged atoms, ions, that have... Um, that have these incredibly well-defined properties, incredibly perfect properties, and then you can control them, confine them with a chip that looks rather like a standard computer chip. And when you marry these two things together, you're in a really exciting region. And then you mentioned the challenges of doing this. So at the moment, all the best quantum computers out there are built out of this trapped ion platform. All the best performance metrics have been demonstrated on these trapped ion quantum computers. But a lot of people right now are building these things as science projects, not engineering projects. And they're building devices that are you know, slightly heroic to build and they're very impressive, but they work on the best possible day with the best possible team around them. And you know, the art of engineering is going from the device that works on the best possible day when you're lucky to the device that works on the worst possible day when it's been assembled by you know, the B team 
or the C team on the day after the Christmas party. And that that challenge is what we're working on at Oxford Ionics. And then what our technology allows us to do is control these qubits using electronics, not lasers. And this allows us to use then chips that can be built very stand very similarly to standard CMOS chips in a standard semiconductor fab. And importantly, what this means is by building larger and larger and larger chips, we can build larger and larger quantum computers since we can integrate all of the elements we need to control the qubits into a chip. So then we can essentially build out these elements and copy paste to scale. And this is why classical computing works at all, the ability to design out individual elements of the chip and copy and paste them to scale out. And that's what we've managed to do with our quantum computing platform. Okay, yeah, so as I understand it, the, the sort of key to this, you've, you've developed the, you, or you can control the qubits with your electronic qubit control system, so as opposed to the, the lasers, and the results you've achieved are fairly spectacular, I think, for both two qubit and single qubit gate performance. So again, can you perhaps put those in context of what was achievable and, and where you've taken this sort of performance level? Right, so there's two challenges in building out useful quantum computers. I said if we have 100 perfect qubits, we have something really fundamentally very interesting that changes computation. And the question is always, how perfect is perfect? And if you don't have perfect qubits, how many do you need to start tackling useful problems? And there's broadly two ways you can approach this in the industry. One is by you know pumping out pretty crappy qubits and lots of them. And you can use this concept called quantum error correction that allows you to take uh, four qubits, many of them together, make them work together and produce essentially logical fewer qubits with much lower error rates. Or you can just engineer better qubits to start with. And any technology needs a mixture of these both. But with a lot of technologies out there, a lot of quantum computing technologies, the error rates are so extreme, you need to have something like an overhead of 100,000 to one. So you need hundreds of thousands of these qubits all working together just to make one good enough qubit. So with our technology, with the error rates we've demonstrated, we're about an order of magnitude ahead of the next nearest state of the art and about two orders of magnitude better than the industry average. And what this means is, first of all, with small devices, we can already tackle applications that would need much larger computers on other people's technology. But as well as that, when we do start needing to correct these errors using quantum error correction in a few generations time, we can have much, much, much lower overheads. So a factor 10 reduction in errors is equivalent to about a factor 10,000 reduction in system size with the error rates that lots of our competitors see. So that factor 10 reduction in error both allows us to start tackling really interesting applications now, but it also allows us to start tackling even more interesting applications in the next few generations with devices that are about 10,000 times smaller because errors are the supermetric of quantum computing. And so I I guess it sounds as if, and I think that it's it's what you're saying, is that sort of what we call useful, because as you said, you know, there's a lot of quantum QE out there, but it's it's almost at the moment no better than classical computing because there, there's just sort of trials and just to prove that it can be done. But in terms of the performance and scale, what you're you, you are achieving it means that what we should call maybe useful quantum computing uh is is a lot closer i mean people i've talked to generally say you know 2030 2035 before anything seriously useful happens that you, you're saying that it could be a lot sooner than that if um with, with what you've developed is that is that right the, the challenge with any sort of technology development is how the risk profile changes ideally you get to the point where you say we know exactly what we need to do we have our perfect blueprint and it's going to cost a billion dollars to build and then you're away, right? As soon as you're unlocking the economic value at a cost much, much less than that, life's easier. Everyone goes out and builds it. And you can build it pretty fast. And the challenge is always finding the right approach to do that, where you can really get certainty on what that timeline is and how those risks burn off. And what we've done with our technology has shown that we can use the magic of the standard semiconductor supply chain to really build these devices with very low risk. We already have these existing supply facilities. We're already producing our devices are, you know, 300 mil wafer processors in leading fabs around the world with very, very high yield. And the challenge of building larger and larger and more powerful devices is a matter of integrating, solving the standard litany of painful issues that you have to solve when you start actually building stuff at scale and product producing it. But these are all much, much lower risk, much, much more easily managed problems. 
than any of our competitors are facing. So we're now in the really exciting phase where we've got to go out and do it. And it's going to be an exciting few years. Yeah, so I think uh, just to clarify, uh, you're already building or you're planning to build, because I, th I think I read that you're planning to build a scalable 256 qubit chip. And as you say, using existing something, so there's no extra expense of you know, building out, building a fab, well, fabs, as we know, aren't, uh, aren't inexpensive themselves. So, yeah, just w where, where are you at when it comes to actually sort of production, if you like? Yeah, so we're already producing our smaller series of devices uh, on production fabs on 300 mil wafer fabs uh, with very high yield. We've already started producing the first prototypes of these 256 qubit devices. And the reason 256 qubits is such an interesting number is because it's kind of the smallest large number. So it's at the point where you both have enough qubits so you can really start tackling the first really market making applications in quantum computing. And obviously from a business perspective, that's a necessary but not sufficient condition. But also from a technology perspective, it's at the point where we have multiple unit cells of everything out there. So we have enough on these devices that we've proven we understand all the interactions between the different elements of the chip. And it means then the 1024 qubit device ends up just being this unit cell on the mask, copy and pasted four times to make larger devices. So we'll already at that point have integrated everything we need into the chip and demonstrated that all of this integrated stuff works together allowing us to then build larger devices by doing more of the same. And, you know, if we take back and think philosophically for a second, the reason the semiconductor supply chain works at all is because we don't have to do that much new stuff in each generation. And you really can just build larger devices by doing more of the same and dealing with the integration issues, but you don't have to reinvent the fundamental technology stack every generation. And this is pretty rare. There's very few technologies where it really does work quite as well as in the semiconductor industry. And our job in the quantum computing industry right now is to focus on learning as much as possible from the semiconductor industry and from making sure that the stuff we do reinvent, uh, we do it very carefully and then take our technology to the semiconductor supply chain rather than trying to build a supply chain that rhymes with the standard semiconductor supply chain, uh, which as you mentioned, ends up you know costing a trillion dollars if you do it wrong. And I'm also intrigued, you, you're working alongside the National Quantum Computing Center. So what, what what's the relationship there? It'd be good to understand. Yeah, so the UK has this National Quantum Computing Center, which we're very good friends with. We've sold one of our uh, early quantum computing systems into there, which we're due to deliver in February next year. And the aim of the National Quantum Computing Center here is to have a quantum computing test bed, which really allows them to test out their ideas and their protocols and give access to government partners, um, access to these uh, top of the range quantum computers. And that's what we're doing. So we're selling them a system. We have a very close relationship. They happen to be about 20 miles down the road from us. So it's very convenient to pop backwards and forwards. And they will have one of our uh, next generation systems installed in a few months time. Okay. And then just looking, looking ahead in terms of your own roadmap, I mean, you know, I suspect there are things you can't tell me, but in terms of what you can, um, is the plan, I suppose, how involved are you? Are you, I say just, but are you doing the, the research and stuff and then you'll license and let sort of commercial organisations, whatever it is, take these things away and run with it? Or are you planning yourselves to become a you know, a manufacturer of, of quantum computing, et cetera? Just, just what you can share as to you know, your your roadmap and and I guess the time frame as to when we might see, uh, you know, the, I would call it useful, but you know, a significant quantum computer, as you say, that the 256 qubit chip, you know, inside, if you like. Yeah. So the time scale for this is a couple of years. So we already have the first prototypes of those chips coming off the production line right now. And we're iterating on the designs of those, and iterating on the packaging and integration of those. And we're starting to discuss those with customers, the first sales of those systems over the next 18 months. So we're already selling these smaller systems which are not systems that can do things you can't do with a classical computer. But what's really important is the infrastructure, the quantum computing platform around that is the same as our larger devices, which can do that. And we offer processor upgrades. So we can in-field upgrade these systems from the smaller chips, which we can sell you now, to the larger chips that we're producing over the next few years. And then, you know, I think there's a big question here about the business model of quantum computing. You know, where's the money? 
and you know what does everyone do in this and our view of the world is that we want to own the architecture around these devices and we want to sell these devices out into the field so at the moment we produce a lot of hardware on site we subcontract out fab of the chips we subcontract out packaging and testing of various different aspects of the chip and then do the integration into the mechanics and our quantum computing assemblies uh, in-house and over time as we start to build our capacity we'll be subcontracting out more and more for mechanical assembly and expect to be acting as a system integrator for these systems. Because the really interesting aspect of quantum computing is how all of these different bits come together and how you integrate. You know, a lot of the secret source, a lot of the magic is how you go about taking your qubits, taking your algorithm, compiling it together and building up all these tool chains. You know, if you want to use the overused analogy, this is like, you know, the CUDA and NVIDIA type stuff. You know, NVIDIA's GPUs are good and all that, but the real magic is how they integrate together with uh, the software stacks and how all of those things go together. And we've thought a lot about this, these aspects of the business model. So one of our, one of our board of directors is Depesh Patel. He used to be the CTO at Arm. So we've thought a lot about how the different business models can go together between, you know, the fully Arm based model all the way through to the Intel model, through to the NVIDIA type models. And at least for the next three or four years, the model of selling hardware directly integrating it directly and subcontracting and manufacture the elements looks looks very exciting and maybe just finally in terms of the the impact the likely impact of quantum computing i mean how significant because clearly at the moment if you like you've got high performance computing and that's it was once sort of erudite for sort of research purposes and it's sort of filtered down into enterprise uh, you know particularly with ai uh, coming on stream if you like at the moment um, is quantum computing do you think that's similar so it'll start at the sort of higher scientific level and then gradually percolate down into enterprises or will it always remain because of the the sheer sort of size and scale of what it can do it will never need to be used or you know just too expensive to be used in an enterprise environment i i think the analogy of uh, hpc is very very accurate um uh, you know perhaps focusing that a bit more narrowly you know you can imagine a, a quantum processor as being an ultra first version of a gpu another iteration of that kind of device which allows you to take certain mathematical structures certain problems and solve them wildly faster than a conventional computer so a gpu might be a hundred times faster for certain problems than a cpu and a quantum processor unit a qpu might be a million times faster for certain problems than a gpu and again these are very certain mathematical structures of problems but it happens that they tend to be very widely represented across many different classes of problems from optimization problems from certain types of quantum machine learning problems through uh problems of modeling materials or modeling drugs or modeling chemical interactions so what we expect to see is as the market starts turning on and as people larger and larger groups of people want to start working out how to program how to control these devices you get the early adopters that are places like high performance computing centers and this is exactly like with advanced compute you mentioned, where people start using these systems just to learn what you can do with them, to develop their thinking and work out how you can integrate them to the larger pieces of the problem. And then as that starts getting commoditized, these start moving down more into enterprise. You know, if you if you look at certain enterprises right now, there are people who are really investing very significantly in quantum computing. You know, if you go speak to all the major banks or financial services uh, players, you know, they'll often have a team of 10 to 40 people with PhDs in quantum computing, working on integrating their problems, going through sorting out their problem books and working out where they can get significant advantage from quantum computing. And that will only accelerate. But for the broader enterprise, it will take time to get there. Okay, um, I think that's covered everything I wanted to ask. And it's been fascinating to understand what's going on at Oxford Ionics and, and just more generally in the world of quantum computing. So, Chris, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. It's been a pleasure to speak to you.